Time to begin our staff meeting, so appreciate you all being here this morning. We've got some uh, presentations to make, and uh, I, I guess I could have, uh, well, first of all, I need to say it's uh, Halloween evening, right? And there's a whole bunch of cupcakes and cookies and stuff, and you can, they're there for people to take and eat, right? And it's safe. Right. There are no jokes or tricks or anything like that. Lindsay and Linda take care of it. Okay. Well, anyway, you have you have the um, invitation to go get some treats sooner or later. But if you get them right now, right in the middle of the presentation, that might be considered rude. But be rude if you want to. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and. Um, the, as you see, the manager's not here this morning. Tom, you want to tell us what happened? So we uh, he was just involved in a, a little bit of accident at 29th and Broadway, so he'll be delayed. He's okay, uh, a little bit shaken up, but uh, he should be in later this morning. Okay, so we will carry on without him, and we um, do have some guests here to make presentations to us before we get started. Commissioners, anything you want to say or bring up before we start off? All right. So well, we, Tom, I'll let you know. we have two presentations this morning, sir. We have an ARC 95 presentation, in which uh, Mr. Spears will facilitate, and then the sheriff, uh, DA, and Alora from 911 are here to talk about uh, records management systems. So, David, you can start us off, sir. All right. Well, Halloween, this is going to be a real treat for everybody. We've got uh -huh. six engineers in the room today. So, you've got brain, major brain power going on here. Um, been a long time coming. Uh, we want to present today the Part 95 uh, project study that we've been doing. Uh, with us today is uh, Brett Lukowski and Slade Ingram from Trans Systems, who is our consultant on it. Uh, on our staff here today is Lynn Packer and Mark Morris, who are co-managers for the project, and also Jim Weber is here. Pretty big deal for us. ARC-95 is a reasonably uh, significant project, and ARC-95 means that's the Arkansas River corridor on 95th Street South, where there is no bridge or road there now, and we're looking at putting a major crossing into there uh, in the future. <clears throat> so what we want to do today uh, is uh, also, uh, two commissioners are familiar with this, three of you aren't, and uh, Commissioner O'Donnell and Commissioner Howell have been in public information meetings uh, ongoing with this. Um, Derby is supportive of it. Hayesville is supportive of it. Uh, if built, uh, it will increase or, or spur development on both sides, and both of those cities are, are pretty happy about that. Um, if we get a consensus today to move forward, what we'll do then is go to WAMPO and present this same presentation to them and then try to get this in the uh, transportation improvement plan and then seek federal funding. <coughs> so with that, uh, I think Lynn's going to lead it off. Lynn Packer from our staff. Good morning, everybody. We have uh, a quick handout here. We have a slide. We have some slides, maps that are on the slides that probably aren't going to view that well. So we just went ahead and just made copies for everyone to view. We'll hand those out while I'm getting up here. These handouts will make a little more sense once we uh, uh, get through the presentation a little bit and start getting into uh, what the presentation was about or what the study was about and uh, the process of the study. Uh, as we're doing that, I'll just start off. And, and uh, for those of you that are not familiar, 
Um, ARC 95 uh, was a study that was initiated as a result of previous studies that were done in the area trying to increase uh, transportation access uh, in the south part of Central County. Um, it was it basically it's looking a little the, the previous studies were a very high level uh, did not have much public engagement um, and uh, this one brought in the public engagement brought in technical staff and and looked at uh, what were the possibilities um, so previously several studies have indicated 95th Street South is a corridor that would be perfect down there uh, and uh, basically if uh, <coughs> if you go back to the beginning this basically started in 2008 with the SATS, SATS the Area Transportation Study. Uh, followed after that was the South Meridian Corridor Plan. Then we had the South Broadway Corridor Plan, the Casino Area Transportation Plan. The set, as going on and on, the area down south has been studied well. Um, we've we've got it covered. Uh, the the main the, the main uh, blue uh, highlight here shows what the South Area Transportation Study came up with and that was uh, the idea of a <sighs> corridor that would connect Cal East Kellogg with West Kellogg via Greenwich over to 95th South up 119th. Um, that SAT study, one of the primary uh, goals for that study <laughs> was to determine, you know, is this going to be a, a bypass like K96, the Northeast bypass, or is this going to be something that the local streets? And that study basically said, hey, yeah, it's disproportionate, the cost is disproportionate to do a bypass. So using the existing infrastructure is the way to go. And that's where the Greenwich 95th, 119th was identified. This study just concentrates on 95th Street South. Um, as you can see, what we did was, it's Greenwich to 119th is the whole corridor. This study looked at Meridian to Greenwich um, with an emphasis specifically on Broadway to Woodlawn. Um, as you'll notice, there's a, a, a pretty big hole uh, that's not highlighted in blue on the screen up there um, with a line through it. That, that's the crossing we're talking about with Arkansas River Crossing. Uh, there is none that existed, and I, and I guess I can just say that uh, it's one of those deals that uh, if, if it was easy, it would already have been done. Um, it's not there because it's not easy. You have the BNSF Railroad, you have K-15, you have floodplain, you have the river. Um, there's a lot in between there and all the way up and down, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, that's why there is very limited crossings down there. So, um, but this area, like I said, looked at and was identified as the best alternative. Um, so what we did was, uh, as part of this study was to go ahead and as a goal to, to confirm that it is 90 you know 2008 was a while ago other studies that piggybacked it but it's 95th Street still what we're looking at for an alignment um, we also looked at uh, you know how many traffic lanes what kind of traffic are we talking about down here uh, are there do we need an interchange intersections what are we gonna do with the driveways access control uh, you know, basically the biggest obstacle and the biggest goal here was how are we going to cross the river, K-15, all of that. Uh, um, we wanted to uh, look at partners. Who can we partner with on this? This, isn't, this is going to be a regional impact, not just Cedric County, not just, you know, Derby or Mulvane. This is, it has a regional impact. So how do we partner? KTA was identified as a potential partner from the very beginning um, because of obviously the interchange that could come up on 95th. Um, the, uh, we also uh, uh, tasked the, the study group with uh, determining what does this look like? Like wh what type of a construction layout are we talking about as far as number of years? How many projects? What's the cost going to be? Just to give us an idea. It's very difficult to project costs 20, 40 years in the future, but is this a $500 million project or is it a $75 million project, you know, what are we, what are we talking about in terms of the scope and the costs? Um, and that's what we looked at uh, for the study. And in the end, what we're looking for uh, is not saying, the study doesn't say yes, do it or don't do it. The study presents the facts, presents what was discussed, 
what the public and what the uh, officials and, and the technical staff and managers all agreed was the best uh, um, options for this corridor and then leaving it for you guys the, the board to decide you know do we do we move forward is this something we want to just l let hang out there on move 2040 do something with it or just decide that yeah this is not what we want to be doing at this time and and just let it, you know kill it here um, as I said, this was something we identified as a regional uh, impact. Therefore, we did bring in stakeholders. Uh, Cedric County, City of Derby, City of Hayesville, WAMPO, KDOT, KTA, all sat on uh, committees that um, uh, facilitated, that were facilitated through the, the study here. Um, we uh, worked with them. We had managers and technical staff from each of those uh, organizations to help us. We also uh, <coughs> Uh, reached out and had conversations with BNSF and the railroads, we, we, we co-ops, uh, to, to, to really look at the impact, as well as having, uh, as you'll hear uh, here in a, a bit, having technical meetings. Um, I will note the City of Wichita and the City of Mulvane were invited to be partners on this, and they, at this time, they just elected, you know, at this level, they elected not to participate, but they were invited. Uh, but we did have a great uh, uh, group of people who came together from local organizations to all participate with, with us. Um, so that's the basic introduction. I'm going to leave the heavy lifting to our consultant, uh, Brett Lakowski with Trans Systems. Uh, they were uh, the lead consultant that worked on the study, and he's going to talk about what the study consisted of, and real brief, and then what we uh, are recommended for the corridor uh, when we, if the decision is made to move forward. All right, well, commissioners, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present this project. I'm just going to quickly kind of walk through our study process and what the results were. Um, <clears throat> we did a series of public meetings. Um, we did one in Hayesville and one in Derby. Um, we did three series of those. Uh, the same information was provided in both meetings, but uh, we did that to, we felt like we'd get better turnout uh, and, and better information from the public. And we did get a lot of um, a lot of input from the public. I think we probably had over 150 people show up to our meetings. Um, <clears throat> then we, the, the county provided traffic counts for us. Uh, we, we did traffic projections. Uh, we did a couple different scenarios to understand how much traffic uh, volumes we'd be looking at. And then that allowed us to kind of look at what the proposed improvements would be. Would it be a three lane or a five lane facility? And then as Lynn mentioned, then we uh, developed a, a, propo a proposed capital improvement plan which includes uh, probable construction cost and right-of-way needs. So our first, uh, in our first round of public meetings, we had about eight or nine questions that we, we put a survey together and handed out to uh, them to fill out. Uh, we also put it online. We had a website. Uh, we had it up for about 10 days to, for people to be able to respond to as well. A couple of the key questions we talked about were uh, what the typical section should be. Should it be rural or urban, which is curb and gutter or open roads? Uh, that dictates whether uh, the, the speed limit. So are we looking at 55 miles an hour or 45 or below? We also asked them, we had our thoughts of where we thought future development would, would, would be spurred, uh, whether it be residential or commercial, but we wanted to hear from those that live down in the south part of the county what, what they thought would happen. Uh, and then the big question is, how do we address that K-15 BNSF 95th Street crossing? Um, is it at grade? Uh, is it road over the rail or railroad over roadway uh, we we wanted their input on that as well and then any other comments uh, that they might have had so then we uh, we took all that information they gave to us uh, we did our traffic projections and we did a couple different scenarios uh, we looked at uh, we do a 20-year projection uh, so we're looking out at 2040 uh, but we also did kind of an ultimate uh, filling out what total uh, development would what kind of traffic volumes that would bring. So it's kind of hard to see, but those elliptical shapes, those are the, the main drivers. Um, so obviously the Wichita metropolitan area uh, creates the most volume that would, that would interact on 95th Street, followed by Derby, uh, Hayesville, and Mulvane. Um, in the interim condition, uh, that is where we didn't have a lot of development. We just, we built, if we built that connection from Woodlawn uh, over to Broadway, um, we're looking, without the KTA interchange, you're probably looking around 12,000 vehicles per day. Uh, but when you add the KTA interchange, it, it bumps it up, to, up about to 15,000 vehicles per day. Um, that's kind of an interim. 
then if then we did another scenario where we put in development where we heard from the public and what we what we we see um, that that raises your traffic volumes up to around 20,000 vehicles per day and just to give you a, a perspective of that uh, for a county road um, that would be like Rock Road at the Air Force Base or 13th Street um, at the Sedgwick County Park. Uh, those have around 20,000 vehicles per day. Um, two other examples in the city of Wichita, uh, Seneca uh, at Kellogg is around 20,000 vehicles per day, uh, or Pawnee at Southeast uh, Boulevard. So th that's the kind of traffic volumes uh, would be generated uh, if this corridor was built. So then um, our second uh, public meeting, and I apologize, you, you're not going to be able to see this on the screen. That's what this handout is, uh, that, that first, that second page. Um, at the second meeting, public meeting, uh, the first thing we did is we, we talked to them about what we heard from them in the first meeting uh, and what those results were uh, from all the surveys they gave us. And then, um, then we gave them another survey in the second meeting, and this one was, was dedicated right to how we addressed the crossing at 95th Street, the BNSF, and K-15. And we heard four, we, from the first public meeting, we, we developed four concepts, and this is what we presented to them. So this first concept is an at-grade crossing, uh, which would have a four-quadrant gate system. Uh, and that picture in the bottom right-hand corner, that's at MacArthur and K-15. Uh, just to give them an example of uh, what, we're, you know, what that would look like, that's something in place here that they would know and understand. Um, you see that red line on the BNSF main, that's about 3,000 feet of track that has to be improved. Uh, there's about a 10-foot grade difference between the top of rail of the BNSF and the center line of K-15. So we can't just build the roadway through there. We have to do some adjustments to the BNSF just to make that an at-grade crossing. Our second alternative is we took the railroad over the, over the roadway. And if you look at that red line on the, on the BNSF main, that is about uh, three miles worth of track uh, improvements that has to happen. Um, the, the controlling grade for the BNSF is about 1% grade. If you think of a typical roadway, the, the cross slope is 2%. So take that down even half of that. That's what we're looking at for, that's how slow we have to be able to raise the grade to get up over the roadway and then, and then back down. Um, we did have a meeting with the BNSF. We talked about all four of these alternatives. Uh, the BNSF was pretty adamant that they did not want their tracks uh, raised at all. Um, and, I, and I understand the reasoning for that. Putting, you're basically putting a hump in their track, and that's very hard on their operations. It's hard on their engines, hard on the trains. Uh, so that's not something they're very interested in. So we then took a look at alternative number three. And this alternative uh, is the roadway over the railroad and over K-15. And from K-15 uh, to where that purple line is, uh, there's about 25 foot of grade difference between um, in, in, that, in that area. So about where that purple line is is where we, we hit back, where we match existing grade. And because of that, we had to change the entrance into that subdivision to the north. And then we have that little connector road uh, that comes down and ties into K-15. Now you see all those arrows in there, that's a lot of conflict points that happens on K-15. K-15 is uh, a high speed route, it's posted at 55 mile an hour speed limit. You can tell that we're in a curve in there and so uh, your sight distance is not very good so safety is a real issue with this alternative and so we, we wanted to find one more alternative. So we'll go to alternative number four and this is actually uh, developed from our, our second, uh, I'm sorry, our first public meeting, we heard from one of the uh, constituents out there who actually works for the BNSF uh, and runs one of their trains. Um, he saw something similar down in Texas uh, to this concept, and so we got onto Google Earth. I don't know how we ever lived without Google Earth before, but um, <laughs> we certainly love it now. Uh, so we went and looked at what, what he was talking about, and, and we developed this concept. And so with this concept, uh, Southbound traffic on K-15, instead of having to get, trying to turn left, uh, we put little slip ramps on there so they would just, they would exit the roadway, come up to 95th Street, and then, then be able to go east or west on 95th, or any traffic on 95th Street that wanted to go southbound on K-15 would get on that on-ramp um, and be able to get up to speed and, and weave back into traffic. 
Now, northbound uh, K-15 traffic, you would just have a, a slip ramp, that, just a normal exit ramp that you would you would have. This takes all conflict uh, conflict points off of K-15. And KDOT obviously was part of our uh, steering and, and te uh, technical committee. Um, they were not in favor of alternative three either um, because they did not like the conflict points on their system. Uh, but uh, they were very much in favor of alternative four. Now, alternative four, if you go to the next page, uh, that's kind of that's showing what the ultimate build out would, would look like. Uh, this was heavily favored um, not only by the public, I think we had about 71% of uh, approval. Um, those that turned in the survey that voted for this alternative, uh, but it was also uh, the steering and technical committees also, this was the alternative that was chosen as well. So the other, uh, the last slide that you have in your hands uh, is the K KTA interchange. Um, what I'm showing you here is just where, the, where we're coming back down and tying into K-15. Uh, there's, there's additional um, transition lanes that go further up and, up and down the KTA to make the connection. But if I zoom out that far, this, this display really doesn't, doesn't show much. Um, but we did have a, a special meeting with the KTA. Uh, they have approved the concept of this design. Um, this is something that's in their 10-year uh, uh, needs survey that was completed back in 2015. Uh, so they have this identified as a potential interchange for them. Um, so obviously these are big projects um, and not something that, uh, as, as Lynn mentioned, the county would be able to take on on their own. So. Another task we were given was to look for different funding sources. And currently today, in the WAMPO Move 2040 uh, Long Range Transportation Plan, there are three projects that are identified um, on this corridor of, of 95th Street that total $12.6 million in funding. Um, additional funding sources uh, through WAMPO would be the Highway Safety Improvement Program. WAMPO is given $1.5 million a year that they are able to uh, assign to projects. Currently, they have uh, the funding uh, allocated through fiscal year 2020, so that would be something you would be looking to try to compete for that funding. Another federal program would be the Railroad, Rail, Railway Highway Crossing Program. That is something that you could compete. It would only fund the portion over the railroad. It would not fund other portions of the project, so it would have to be in, used in conjunction with some of these other funding sources. Uh, another one is the fast lane uh, grant, or it's, it's actually now called the Infra Grants. 90% um, of the funding for that grant is for projects 25 million and larger, um, and then 10%, the, the remaining 10% is for funding for projects in the five to 25 million dollar range. Now, on, on this Infra Grants projects, um, you can get up to 60% funding uh, through that project or through that grant alone, and use other federal funding sources to get up to 80% of, for federal funding on the project, and then there has to be a 20% local match. Um, another alternative that we looked at or we discussed with the KTA uh, was maybe doing something with the 95th Street interchange, adding a small toll to that interchange for just the users who use that interchange to help pay for some of those funding. Um, that is something the KTA was, they were not opposed to. Um, that, would, they would, that would be something they would be willing to talk to uh, if this were to move forward at some point in the future. And then uh, obviously the city of Derby and the city of Hayesville, there's some, there, there would be improvements for them. Uh, they could be also another uh, assistance on local funding. So the last thing is we developed a, a capital improvement plan, and I apologize, this is, uh, it's kind of tough to see, very, very difficult to read, I, I apologize. The very top line um, is the 95th Street Bridge over the Cowskin Creek. That's over by Broadway. That is in your current uh, capital improvement plan, and you have approved the design contract of that project already. So that project is going to happen. That's, that's this, this bridge right here. Uh, so I, we showed this to the public, that this is going to happen um, no matter what, if nothing, even if nothing else happens. Um, so then the phase one uh, is the purple. Um, this over here on the east side. Obviously, this is the biggest piece of the project. It's making that connection that Lynn pointed out that doesn't exist today. Um, <clears throat> now, what we're showing in, 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 our, in our dollars here for construction is about $47 million. Um, that is the ultimate build-out. Um, 
you could do this a little bit differently. We're showing the full four-lane bridge over the Arkansas River. You could build that as a two-lane bridge with a multi-use path on it. And at some point in the future, when the traffic projections or when the traffic grows and you need the additional two lanes, you could build a twin structure. Um, but we were just looking at the ultimate at this time. If you did that, there's a roughly $10 million in savings in the, in the initial project cost. Then the, the second phase, um, <clears throat> we're really looking at turn lanes at Broadway, Hydraulic, and Hillside at 95th Street. And, and those would be needed as development occurs and as, as the traffic volumes increase. What we saw in, in our traffic modeling is traffic from the southeast part of the county is wanting to go to the northeast, out to the northeast. And then traffic from the southeast is going to the northwest. So they're using Hillside and Hydraulic and Broadway uh, quite a bit to get up to 235 and to go the different directions that they're going. So, um, and, and all of this is going to be, it, it also is dictated on when the KTA interchange would be built. Uh, if the KTA interchange was built early on, then some of these turn lane movements at Broadway, Hydraulic, and Hillside may not need to be added in because the traffic's going to be used in KTA more so than, than they would be using those streets. Um, or the, the turn lanes would not need to be as long so the cost would come down. But we're trying to show a worst case scenario here um, and we, we just made the assumption that the KT interchange would be built in the later part of the 20 year program. Uh, in the last phase, phase three is adding uh, a third lane between Hydraulic and Hillside. Um, now as the ultimate concept, and I've got a big long roll plot that I don't have anywhere to put in the room. Um, what we show is in the ultimate is a five lane facility, but in, in, in 20, we're seeing 20 years out, we don't see the need for, for a five lane facility, um, in, at least in that section from uh, hydraulic, I'm sorry, from hillside over to uh, the river, the, the Arc River Bridge. Um, so this purple lane in here, that, what we're really showing is, it, is a two lane facility with paved shoulders. That would be able to accommodate uh, the 20,000 vehicles per day, um, but we do need paved shoulders so if a car breaks down, they can safely get off the side of the road, allow traffic through, and they can tend to their car. Now, in the bottom of this, and it's in our report, um, the one thing we, we put a note on this, on this sheet is for all the agencies to be <coughs> conscious of where the development really is going to happen. What we think will happen is we think the development is likely going to occur probably on the over here on, at Broadway and 95th Street and pops, you know, to the west well, in that whole intersection. And the other area that's already starting to grow is at 95th Street and Rock Road. So where you spend your money in this corridor, we probably need to consider looking going all the way over to Rock Road and, um, as, as you look at this in the future uh, because we know developments are already starting to occur at Rock Road. So just understanding what that's going to happen. So um, that was our, that's our recommendation. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it back to Lynn to, to close up. Thank you, Brett. Okay. Um, that was the study in a, in a, nut, in a real quick nutshell. Uh, this lasted uh, most of this year, uh, or uh, yeah, most of the year. And uh, what we have, uh, as you can tell, we have not said do it or don't do it. That's a decision for you know, the county commissioners. Uh, what we have done is prevented, presented what was recommended and, and what the technical committees was, is the public has said that they want to see down there. But I will kind of uh, emphasize that what I like about this is, is what's been presented. It's very fluid. There, there's nothing saying that, that has, this has to be phase two or phase two has to contain all of this. That's for future staff and future management and, and elected officials to determine. Uh, funds and, and development will dictate really how that moves. We've made assumptions, but we're making assumptions 40 years out, 30 years out. So. We can, what we can tell you right now is it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do any of this unless we get the crossing in. So it's kind of a foregone conclusion, on our end at least, that if anything happens, it's that crossing first. That's the first phase, and that's what's been identified there. Um, and then we, there's 
multiple ways we can build out and continue the corridor if that decision is made to do that. Uh, as some of you may be aware, uh, the, corridor, the ARC 95 corridor that was identified is already in WAMPO's MOVE 2040 plan and, and the outlier years. Um, so really at this point, um, after reviewing it and after having all the questions answered, it would, I think what we'd be um, looking for out of this is kind of a decision whether do we just leave it out there, kind of do nothing and just leave it out there in the move 2040 outlier and continue to push it out? Uh, do we decide now that this is not what we want to do, it's not where we want to invest our future funds and direction and just kill it here? Or do we want to maybe take a, a little bit of an action, not committing any funds or anything, but do we want to make the decision to, hey, okay, let's work with WAMPO and in a near future tip, add it to the near future transportation improvement program, um, at least to get it started. Um, and, and obviously that is still going to be some years out. It's going to give us time to create those partnerships and find that funding and figure out how this is all going to develop. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that it is very fluid. It, it, it does, this is by no means, in the end, he talked about a five-lane a five facility. We may find ourselves 25 years in the future going, it's just not happening. It's a three-lane facility at max, and that's plenty for what we need. And that's what it ends up being, and, that, and that's very fine. And, that, and we show that that creates the, the access uh, that's needed down there. Hey, that's a great savings on, on what we would end up building out there. The only thing that's kind of a, a, a foregone conclusion, like I said, is just getting that crossing in there. That is the generator for everything. So um, with that, um, if there are any questions, we're happy to stand and answer those questions here for you. And obviously, we're available anytime. Uh, you guys already received a copy of the report here uh, last week. Um, if, if anyone else is <coughs> executive staff is in need of a copy, we can make that arrangements with you. Um, but we're available for questions. Thank you, Richard. Okay. One more question on this alternative number four. Can you tell me why we can't have slip lanes on that east side like they do on the on the O versus on the east side? Um, well, nothing is written in stone, but uh, the idea is to eliminate the uh, conflict points. And by having it there on the west side, we have all right turn movements, no left turn, no conflict points. And that was the preferred. Well, but I mean, instead of this loop thing, why can't you have a similar thing on, on, that, on the east side of the road? Oh, oh, having twin yeah. ramps on each side. Yeah. Um, that is that is a possibility. Um, that is uh, what we basically did was uh, try to create the access from the neighborhoods in Woodlawn to the north, um, and that's an that actually uh, partially uses an existing route that's already there. Um, and the idea was to enhance that access for them. Uh, but yeah, it's a very like I said, that is a possibility. Well, it just seemed like it'd be easier. I guess uh, I'd, I'd like to. Well, I might just add, we could do that. It, it would add more cost because you're building walls to, to, to bring those slip ramps up. Uh, this is this is all at grade, so this was a we did this because it was a cost savings on the east side. Right. But but we we could look at that at some point in the future if that would if this were to move forward. It, that could be looked at. And just think about just convenience. Okay, that's fine. I, I need to get a map printed off that shows this area from there all the way over to Rock Road, I guess, so I can put everything in perspective kind of see. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. No problem. You mean like the one that's on the wall there? Yeah. <laughs> but it goes further, right? What's that? Further east and north. I want a little bit more north and south. I believe that's the one we have that's rolled up and yeah. would you mind? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be we don't have to get in. Yeah, I, I don't know. On your slide. Yes. So you're looking for? Well, I mean, do you have one that will fit on my desk? Ah, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's well, in your presentation. It doesn't have to be an aerial. It can be. There you go. Go back. You know what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, you want to cover it all the way from 119th out to Greenwich yes. along that corridor. And a little bit north and south, and then that type of thing. Okay. We'll, we'll be fine. Yeah, that won't, that we have isn't gonna be what you're this about. size. It'll stretch your offices and, and your neighbors, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll get you maps till you're happy. Okay. Maps are us. All right. <laughs> so what is that? What, um, what is the overall strategy? I mean, how does how does this compete with, or uh, be a hindrance to? <coughs> what we had as kind of a priority as the North Junction trying to get funds to to do that project. I mean, are they totally mutually exclusive? Or are they competing for the same funds? You know, and yeah, I mean, they are competing competing for the same same funds. The idea would be that uh, the for like the Northwest Bypass they're talking about and everything um, and, and the junctions up there, that's something that's already in the works now. What we'd be going after is funds afterwards, essentially. Um, so that, like I said, because this is a long range plan, we're not, uh, we don't see much happening in the next five to 10 years, uh, except for maybe the start of the first project, trying to get the, the, that uh, footwork started, get that groundwork laid out. So the idea would be that uh, it would follow, uh, and Jim is here. Well, I just would say the North Junction is really a 100% uh, KDOT responsibility. They're not pushing it right now because they don't have the money to match it. Um, this one, because it's mostly on local routes, it has some interaction with KDOT. It's a little different place because you know we're going to have to push this locally if we want it. <clears throat> um, there would always be projects that you have to you know, juggle or WAPO's gonna have to juggle which one goes first. But um, I don't think this tries to replace the North Junction because I still think that's a very important project. But um, because of the planning time for these, we gotta be talking about it now. I'm sure if KDOT came down tomorrow and said, we're ready to do North Junction, and this is what we need from the county. And if it's anything like out west, that was uh, $11.6 million. That's a lot of money. This is a lot more money. You're going to have to struggle a lot more with this one than whether you want to participate in North Junction, for example. It's probably going to be a pretty easy decision for you up there. But this one, because you have to, even if we get draw federal money to it, we're going to have to do the work to get the federal money to it. I think that you confused me more. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and in, and in a didn't say anything, mentioned the, the Northwest Bypass, which is also something that um, we have kind of a priority on. I mean, do we have to do we have to rank this with the Northwest Bypass then? Um, well, this is my personal opinion, but I would say no. The Northwest Bypass activity right now is strictly about preserving the right of way. And will probably be that way for a couple of decades um, before anybody's ready to go out and build on that. Uh, North Junction can't wait a couple of decades. So if that gets going, everybody's gonna jump on it. This one's probably somewhere in the middle of the two. That I would say, if uh, if the commission decides this is has some kind of priority that that you would want to do, this initial stuff at K15 and the BNSF railway would be not 20 years out, you know, five to seven years out, kind of thing. So it's kind of like you're always going to have projects working in different stages. And so this is, as an example, North Junction. They literally have plans for the first phase of that on the shelf, ready to go. And so that's just waiting for somebody to bring some money to it. This one, we haven't done the plans. We have to kind of identify what it is we want to do, if we want to do anything, and start working the plan. So it's kind of an intermediate thing. And the Northwest Bypasses, again, we need to keep doing the right-of-way preservation work, but it's farther out. I might continue to say I plan to drive on it before I die, but um, I hope to live a long time. <laughs> Probably how that will work out. But they're, they're just in different, their time frames, I think, are totally different. Okay. Well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know if, if this consideration requires us to prioritize what is the economic development potential for this and the traffic usage for this as compared to the economic development for the Northwest Bypass and the traffic usage for that. And, and uh, you know, I just don't want to, I mean, I, I can see this is needed and I, and I see it be great for this section of our county and I'm certainly not opposed to it, but I just need to know how to rank them. But you're kind of saying they don't compete. In the grand scheme of things, they do compete, but 
for example, Wampo's Move 2040 plan is, is got, it's a banded plan, so there are projects in the uh, 15 through 19 range, and we have one of these projects in the 19 through 26 range, and we have one of these projects in the 26 through 40 range. Um, so we've already got them spread out, um, and I think Northwest Bypass is in there, and I'm pretty sure the North Junction is in there, and, but they're just in different <coughs> phases all the time, I and mean, we're just you would have to, I think, decide uh, would you be willing to invest in right away in design money to get this one going. And that's going to take X number of years to get to where you're ready to actually build anything and then you have to, you know, that might juggle around a little bit. And all of it, I think, and what Lynn was trying to say is none of this is in the TIP, which is a four-year plan, the short four-year plan right now. So the question I think we have coming up is, there's a new TIP coming up, so uh, are we interested in trying to push push this into the tip or is it still a little bit farther out um, or if the decision is we don't want to mess with it at all then you know when the next long-range plan comes up which is also in the next year or two we got to decide whether to submit those projects or not submit those projects and push them thank you I guess uh, Commissioner Renza and Commissioner Unruh are kind of on the same uh, wavelength as I am on both of my comments but first of all let me start with the uh, Northwest bypass uh, I know that our number one priority from Sedgwick County is the, that uh, junction, North Junction. But I, every place that I've been and everyone I've talked to, uh, I've tried to convince them and, uh, and tout the benefits of building the Northwest Bypass. Uh, that, that it, <coughs> I know what Sedgwick County's number one priority is, but my number one priority <laughs> is honestly that uh, uh, Northwest Bypass. And, and it's for several reasons. One. And you mentioned we were already starting to uh, acquire property along that uh, area. In addition, uh, we've got a protective overlay across that. And, and now you're talking about 20, 30 years that we're going to have a protective overlay. Well, what that does is it restricts the landowner's rights from being able to use their property to the fullest extent because we have put a protective overlay on that. So we're going to have to start becoming serious on whether or not we care about getting that bypass built or not or we care about just uh, denying the property owner's rights to be able to do whatever that they want with their property. I truly want to build the road, uh, and I, I want the people to understand that. But uh, by the same token, if you're telling me it's not going to be built, uh, I, I'm for pulling the protective overlay and letting the people do what they want out there. Now, we've already purchased 25% of that property, or 28% somewhere in that vicinity, we need to keep moving forward with that. If something else starts detracting us from uh, from pursuing the Northwest Bypass, then I'm going to object to it. Okay, so that's my comments on the Northwest <coughs> Bypass. Uh, the other comment that uh, Commissioner Ranzau had, uh, he uh, he came up with the same idea I did. I look over here at the turnpike, <coughs> and you got nice on ramps and off ramps, and you built this thing that only uh, an engineer's mother would love. On the other side, <laughs> we well, I, and I will say, from the from the technical side, we do love that the way that looks, mostly because of the conflict. Um, but I will say, uh, Brett is, is is you know hit the nail on the head with his explanation. Uh, well, if we build both ramps on both sides, it's uh, non-existing infrastructure. Um, not only that, but it's elevated walls, MSC walls that we have to build out there uh, to be able to do that. So we're double, you know, we're going to double the cost of those ramps, whereas using the existing part of the existing infrastructure at grade is a great cost savings and still gets the traffic and it gets it away from just all right there at K15. It spreads it out and that's safer. That's just a safer traffic corridor. Uh, but in the future, in the future though, <laughs> like I said, that that exactly could be what's built. Those, those were my thoughts, and uh, I know both my commissioners uh, have already mentioned them, but I wanted to make sure I put my two cents worth in. I didn't even know you knew it, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I really appreciate the presentation today. You all did a great job, and uh, thanks for working on this. Uh, I do think this is regionally important. You haven't really talked about, I, I, you know, I understand there is actually a slightly larger topic, and that is vision down the road should the R95 go from Meridian to I say Greenwich down the road there's a plan of turning that I heard it called Parkway of turning that and headed towards Kellogg so that you end up with a, a uh, I'd say a south loop around uh, basically much of the uh, urban 
population. So it'd go down Greenwich, then down the Parkway, down 95th, all the way to the west. Yeah, that's shown here. And it would tie back into Kellogg on the west side. So <coughs> I don't know if you know where that would be, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, it's just shown here on the on the yeah, screen right now. Screen. That would be 119th. Yeah. So again, this you know this is similar to the Northwest Bypass in that in that discussion. Uh, I think we ought to keep that in mind. Uh, I mean, there's uh, this is the R95 that you described today from from roughly K15 to Meridian, and uh, that is obviously the first step. But it does tie into a much larger project because we have to keep in the back of our mind at least. Yes, and we've we've talked about uh, the length of construction just for 95th Street, and then just noting that hey, that isn't doesn't even go the full uh, Southern uh, Area Transportation Study. I mean, covered you know the rectangular route Greenwich from 119th. City of Wichita right now, in conjunction with us, is already doing a portion separately, coincidentally, but in conjunction with this, they're already doing two miles of Greenwich Road south of Kellogg. That's just going to play into this. Um, 119th is being developed on each side right now in the city of Wichita. That development is also occurring. So while we are uh, right now concentrating on this south leg on 95th Street, development itself is creating the corridor already um, on the north and south uh, or east and west edges that will eventually all tie in. Um, and by identifying that now and working with the cities and, and the region to identify this corridor, when the projects come up like this, that's what they'll look at. Oh, the idea is this will be a parkway. This is going to be more than just a two-lane road. And they can incorporate that now versus having to reconstruct later. Another, another thing about this, which I think is interesting, but uh, Derby, uh, I'm sure they recognize the people that live to the, to the south of 95th. Maybe people who live to the north of 95th, maybe within a mile or so, would probably we we'll probably go to 95th to cross the river and maybe access the KTA and get into uh, Northwest Wichita or even uh, Northeast Wichita, depends on which way they want to go. But uh, Derby has been supportive of that. Uh, Northwest Bypass is a little bit different. If I understand correctly, there hasn't been a lot of support from, I guess, our friends across the street necessarily to do the Northwest Bypass because it funnels people around around Wichita, and there hasn't been. <coughs> we haven't had. We actually haven't had. We haven't had support necessarily for that project because of that. That's accurate. Um, so I don't know, there's a small difference there as well. Uh, I guess I would say, another thing that's obvious to me, I don't know if anybody else uh, recognizes, but I mean, let me just point it out, but from um, from MacArthur, we, have, we basically have a KTA, KTA access at MacArthur, and there is a bridge over the Arkansas River at MacArthur, and there's another bridge to, a mile to the south of 47. Then you've got to go two more miles to 63rd to cross the river, then you've got to go two and a half miles to cross the river 83rd Street, then you have to go four and a half miles to go to 119th Street, which is actually routed through Mulvane. So right now, you know, if you wanted to to, uh, to find a path from anywhere over there in that region into Wichita, more than likely you're going to follow it, Rock Road or K15 into Wichita. And therein lies the problem. If we see growth over the next 20 years or 30 years, and this uh, this road is not there, we're going to see increasing traffic on K15 and Rock Road. And right now, I don't know if anybody else out there is aware of what's going on, but it is. It's going to require some type of expansion to deal with uh, increasing traffic loads there as well. So, this is, uh, in my opinion, either either do this to off to, to provide some uh, pressure relief on the other arterials, or we're going to have to plan on doing some uh, improvements on K15 and, and, and Rock Road, which is going to be very complex also. So, I don't know that we have a way to necessarily uh, bury our head in the sand and do none of the above. I mean, one of the, one of the one of those issues is going to have to go forward. And uh, to me, uh, this is the one I think that right, right now, if you live anywhere over there, you're gonna, you're gonna appreciate the way to get in and out of the uh, city and, and, and around Wichita uh, by the access to KTA and then finding a bypass around around K-15 and Rock, <coughs> Rock Road. Um, to me, this is uh, trying to make, I guess, the, the people, constituents, the voters, and the, the taxpayers all happy, trying to find a way, a different route uh, through. Um, right now, the only way people get in and out right now primarily is Rock Road, Rock Road and K-15. And by the way, along that line, Greenwich is getting crazy busy. Because Rock Road is so busy, a lot of people are using uh, Greenwich. Yes. And that's not, in my opinion, a great road. It's a two-lane without shoulders, and it's high speed, 55 miles an hour. And I know a lot of people, especially as I continue to try to pave the areas to the, to the east, uh, trying to find our, our mile every two years, I, find, I try to find arterials and connections from paved roads to paved roads. I, I know people that uh, if I was to pave 143rd Street between 55th and 47th, for example, 
I, I know a lot of people who take a route uh, into uh, uh, down Greenwich into Kellogg, especially West Kellogg and Greenwich and Kellogg and Web Road are done. So we're, we're seeing significant growth on, on the east side, Greenwich, <coughs> Web Road, uh, Rock Road, and Nucky 15. All of that is growing. And to me, it, it depends on which way, which way people are headed. But yeah. uh, this is an entirely different arterial, different direction entirely, and does remove some pressure from those other roads. So I'm very supportive of this. Uh, I did attend those meetings. You all did a great job. I talked to people. Uh, I only had a couple of people really that had any concerns I saw. Most people are pretty, uh, think it's a good idea. And I think that uh, knowing that Derby's in favor, I mean, I've talked to people in Little Bay, and they're not against it, even though they, their growth area kicks into 95th Street. Uh, that doesn't hurt them in any way. Uh, it, did, it would could be argued that uh, some people in Derby, uh, business-wise, would see less traffic, and they may not like that. But it does make people happy. And so Derby, thankfully, has been very supportive of that. And, uh, Oh, I say, I say, uh, whatever the one of those. You didn't show us any dollars today, other than that one slide for ninety-five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that's not what the Arc ninety-five stands for, but uh, ninety-five million dollars and Arc ninety-five. I'm glad it's not any farther than south. Let's say that. Yes, and though, and I, you know, I would probably point out with those with these figures. First of all, uh, when you read the small print, you know, there's a, a thirty percent contingency that's been thrown into that. We're using twenty seventeen dollars, and we're talking about stuff twenty forty years in the future. It's very hard. We're also assuming these numbers assume the full five lane ultimate blowout of everything, which there's a very like I said, there's a very good chance we don't you know the future and development everything just shows that it has increased traffic, but not to a five lane standard. A three lane may be more than sufficient. Well, what do you need from us today? Because again, I don't know that you're asking us to hone in on a on one of the designs or, or to challenge. I guess I've heard some ideas here to maybe add a design to to your uh, plate of options there. But are we just trying to, to ascertain support from BOCC to move it over to over Wampo and let them pick the design? Or what's the what's the plan here? Uh, you know, officially today, it's just informative and, and letting you know. Introducing the report that was given to you. Uh, last week uh, uh, is an overview of uh, instead of having to, uh, unless you choose to read all 365 some pages. Uh, the, the I will point out that the public was greatly in favor of this. Um, y y there was no way 100 percent. You're never going to have 100 percent in these cases. But the comment cards, as well as a summary of, of the comments we received and the types of questions that were answered, all all in the report. Um, and I was, you know, as far as what we're looking for from you. Um, again, it, it, we would be looking for you at a, at a future time to um, either make a commitment to move forward with this in the future. And again, we're not asking for any kind of a financial commitment, just that, you know, the way I've been kind of telling people is, you know, yes, we're going to put this on the dartboard and put it in our long-range transportation plan. Um, you know, technically it is already there with the move 20, Wampo's move 2040, but it continues to be on the outliers. This would be a purposeful say, we want to move forward, we want to look at moving forward with that. Another viable option is, is you guys look at everything and decide that, yeah, this, this is, we, we have other interests and this is just not the time for this and it just needs to be off the table for the long run and, and just kill it here. Uh, the other option is just to say, hey, it's not what we want to do right now. We're going to just continue to leave. We're not going to do anything and leave it as an outlier. Yeah, well, so we, in order to uh, kind of move this forward, and then I suppose, David, you might come around and, and check with commissioners in order to, to find out what our perspective is in it rather than trying to hammer this out all this morning. And we have the information now. If we have more questions, we can uh, go back to David or Jim and uh, get them. But you can come and, come and check with us to see what our opinion is on where we want to place this in our thinking. I'll do that. Okay. I do want to point out that we will be uh, presenting to WAMPO uh, Transportation Policy Board uh, here on November 27th, I believe. Um, and again, it's just going to be an informational meeting um, and letting them kind of the same presentation we had here. Okay. All right. Well, then thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, well done and uh, lots of information. And it looks to me like you guys did a lot of work, so we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um.
Well, we have the sheriff, sir. We're going to talk about uh, CAD a little bit and records management system needs. The sheriff has a 10 o'clock he has to get to, but he'll kick us off. And then we have some staff uh, behind us that will cover the technical questions. So let the sheriff get going. Well, good morning. Uh, one of the things that we want to discuss with you, uh, currently uh, CAD is being looked at by Alora for a brand new CAD system. Um, Mark Bennett's going to discuss with you uh, his need for an RMS system, of course the uh, Sheriff's Office need for an RMS system, and then Dr. Rorig is here uh, to talk about uh, uh, his needs for records management as well. Um, we have an opportunity here uh, to actually uh, look at this in a uh, totality of public safety and all of us being on the same records management system. Um, currently we're all separated, uh, Wichita Police Department's here as well because they're looking uh, at a new RMS system as well. In 2005, uh, we had the opportunity to try to do this. Um, it didn't work out. We all bought separate systems and they're all antiquated now. And so we're having to go back through and buy new systems and we want to discuss with you the value of why all it, trying to combine all these systems together uh, would be the best fit for, for us in public safety. Are all the systems about the same age needing re replacement? Okay. Good morning. I know that I have discussed with you guys our needs for a new CAD system, which if you recall, that's the computer-aided dispatch system. The, what we input all the 911 calls into, it helps us with response plans and investi uh, investigatory issues later. That's used for records in court. and um, So the CAD's a big hub for everything in public safety. And so you guys graciously agreed to help fund a new CAD system, and so that was already built into our 2018 budget. But where it gets interesting and where the collaboration becomes important is that as we are looking at CAD systems and figuring out what we can do in the future and what we're not doing now that we didn't realize we could do is there's a point of integration where it starts to build real efficiencies for us in dispatch. It can build efficiencies out in the field. And as we're talking to other CAD vendors, as we're talking to our stakeholders over at the city of Wichita and with the county and our suburban law enforcement <coughs> and fire departments, they're asking for us to help to build those efficiencies through um, an integrated system where CAD and RMS are with the same vendor or a vendor, uh, vendors that work very well together. And so we are at a point where, and I say we, and I think everybody in public safety is at that point where we need those efficiencies to be built in because we are busy, we're getting busier, the world's getting busier. And so anything we can do to help to build, um, to build efficiencies, to make us more effective, to make us in dispatch uh, to see a, bi a bigger picture. It helps with field unit safety. It helps with citizen safety. So there's some opportunities here where if we are to, uh, able to collaborate and get stuff that works together, that it will make a better public safety system for both our first responders, for our dispatchers, and for our public that we serve. But that's the basics on the CAD and what we're looking at, because I know I went into that in the budget. I think, um, Mark Bennett, if you want to come up and talk about your needs. Good morning. So just to give you a little uh, background here, um, so if somebody's arrested on the street, first thing that will happen, let's say it's a Wichita case, the WPD will arrest the person, uh, they d uh, gather information, generate a report. So that's the first point at which a human resources is implemented in this process. They'll then say they book him, book the individual into the jail, and the jail has to because you know, there's integration, there's, there's interfaces between the two, but with, as we add these new systems, if WPD goes to one, SO, let's say SO went to a different one, I went to a different one, the court system went to a different one. Each one of these would have data entry points where information would have to be loaded, and then we'd have to build interfaces between the two for them to communicate, which can be done. It's what we, what we have done in the past, but those interfaces are not free. They take human resources from your IT departments, or we have to uh, go to the vendor who, who supplies the the uh, software package that, that each of the individual uh, offices or departments have used. But again, back to the scenario. So the police officer has, has put a report together. The jail has a, a, a deputy who has had to um, in upload information into the jail system. Then the detective comes over and brings a case for charging. My office makes a charging decision. We charge them. Then my office has to re-enter all the information as well. Then the case gets to the court. The case is filed. There's a case filing. It goes into the court system. At some point, the court is now adding more information. It's just that there's a lot of repeating redundancies there. Um, 
and while we all have our own different budgets, and yes, I'm different than the sheriff who's different than the city, at the end of the day, we're all coming from Sedgwick County. Um, you know, taxpayers are, are putting the money into these systems. So it makes sense that as we, we are at this sort of crossroads right now, uh, that we at least inform our uh, the, the folks who, who control the, the revenue for us what's going on and what where we're headed. And I don't think there's a decision point to be made today. This is more informative so you know what sort of uh, steps are being taken by the uh, various agencies. Um, one thing, a couple things have kind of brought this to the fore, though, which is why we asked to speak to you today. One is, um, as the sheriff said, we all of us are kind of reaching the point where we need something new. Uh, frankly, I'm probably, in terms of, of support, uh, my office is, is doing fine. However, something has happened that has caused this to, to have, have an issue for us, and that is that, let's see here, it was just last month, so uh, no, uh, September 18th of 2017, uh, the Kansas Supreme Court announced that full court, which is the uh, data information system that, this court sit, that the court uses, um, is going to be uh, replaced. Now, we had known for a year or so that they were looking at it. Frankly, we had hoped they were simply going to upgrade to full court, you know, point two or whatever it would have been. Uh, but they have not. Um, and they've gone to a brand new system called Odyssey with Tyler Technologies Incorporated. And, uh, you know, when the Supreme Court tells me this is the new system, uh, I have no choice but to figure out how to adapt to it. I'll either, I'll have a couple of choices. Uh, one will be to um, either purchase or we'll see, maybe they'll offer it to the various uh, county and district attorney's offices around the state, uh, a prosecutor <coughs> module coming out of Tyler Technologies. I could do that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean I'll be, if I accept that, that I'll be compatible with the sheriff or with 911 or with uh, WPD. Um, but if I don't accept it, I want you all to know why I'm not accepting something from the Supreme Court is that I'm trying to work with my local partners here so that we have something that requires uh, the fewest number of interfaces possible <coughs> and uh, ideally if we could find a package that works for all of the various uh, uh, law enforcement safe, you know, uh, uh, public safety uh, agencies within the county, that would make obviously a lot of sense. Um, let's see here, just so you have some, again, some sense of, of um, uh, how things, how we interact with, with, with my other partners here in the county and also the age of things. Full court was implemented in 03 by, um, it, it, again, that's what the, the county courthouse, the, the, the court system uses. We went to a data management system called Justware in 09. Um, <clears throat> but just so you have a sense of, of how much of my work is reliant upon both the sheriff and the WPD, um, let's see here, between those two agencies, roughly 89, 80, 8% of my cases come from those two agencies. You know, the, the remaining 10 to 11 on any given year are going to come from Derby, Goddard, you know, the smaller municipalities. But WPD's 65 to 75% of my cases on a given year this last year, I think that 69%. SO is going to be 18 to 20%, 15 to 20%. So at the very least, if we could make sure that whatever interaction we, we these agencies go to, WPD, SO, my office, the court system, uh, 911, JIAC, JDF, I mean, all of these different uh, public safety entities, <laughs> uh, if we could all be on the same page moving forward, uh, there'd be a lot, of a lot of time and money saved, both in human resources and just flat out cash coming out of the county, out of the city, out of the various uh, uh, budgets of, of the different agencies here, because um, while we can all go by, a, there's going to be a prosecutor model that would be perfect for me, that would be great, but it ain't going to talk to the sheriff or to the city or the others, and we can certainly do interfaces. That's what we have done in the, in the past, and it's, like I said, it has worked, but that still requires a lot of, of uh, somebody has to still enter that data, they, has, they still have to learn how to talk to each other, and it costs, it costs money. So again, my, my sense of this is that we wanted to bring this to your attention, uh, because at some point we're going to be coming back to you and saying, you know, we may need to, to act in in real time, I mean, I'm I'm the one who's having. I have the one un, um, unilateral um, uh, decision that's being sort of imposed upon us, and that's fine. I, I you know that's how it works. But I'm the one who the Supreme Court is going to come in at some point and say this has to be up and running by a date certain, and I, it may not be in my normal budget cycle where I can come to you and say, 
you know, in March, this is what I think I'm going to need in 2021, and you, you can allocate for it ahead of time. I may be given notice that six months from now this needs to be up and running. I don't know. Um, we know that what they've bought, but we have yet to see, you know, uh, what the vendors are thinking in terms of, of when they'll make it, roll it out for um, the various 105 counties. Um, so anyway, that, that's, that's an unknown for me that I'm ha I'll have to wrestle with. And my goal is to keep you informed as I learn more information uh, so that you can make, well, so that you'll be in, in, in better position to make uh, informed decisions. But so I'm the one that's got the, the maybe the crisis point up, up front. Uh, meanwhile, the WPD is working. They've got a, a system themselves that is, is um, I won't say antiquated, but it's not supported to their, uh, you know, and obviously when you have an unsupported uh, system, that causes concerns for the agency. So they're actively working. The sheriff's working. This is a time when we're all trying to get on the same page. So that's that was the impetus for today's conversation. Examples of other uh, city county governments that have used the whole integrated system has been successful. Uh, yeah, I mean, part part of the problem is in some of the county systems in in Kansas, at least, with 105 counties, we've got some that are so small. You know, the county attorney's office is going to file 50 cases a year. I mean, integration of that system could be an Excel spreadsheet that everybody's on. I mean, I'm not being demeaning there, but I mean, it's to try to compare us to other counties in the state it's difficult. Johnson County is wrestling with this. They have a different set of issues than we do. Uh, with 70, you know, 65, 75 percent of my cases coming from one law enforcement agency, WPD, um, you know, that, that it is a wholly different than Johnson County, for instance, where they have, I think, 23 different agencies, you know, Lenexa, Olathe, Overland Park. There is no, there's no major contributor. Everybody, you know, one or two departments are larger than the others, to be sure. but. Um, what they have done of, re of late because of this, this lack of integration, they, they were all on different uh, data management systems, uh, and I think it's this spring they're trying to roll out a system called Niche. Uh, the WPD is looking at that as well, um, and they're trying to get all 23 agencies on that, on that data management system. Now, I've talked to the county, or this district attorney up there, uh, Steve Howe, and he's indicated that the, the DA's office is not going to go to Niche, but they're going to be able to integrate with Niche and be on that, that package. That's in a Kansas analysis or a Kansas analogy, excuse me, um, that's the only one that I'm aware of that's on, that, that's at least got all their law enforcement agencies on one um, um, software, but I, it's not rolled out just yet. It is in the process right now of getting all 23 agencies on, onto that. But that's an example at least. Anyone else? Any other questions? Thanks for the presentation. Yes, sir. Where, so where will this be? So you have a common system that both, I guess, the SO and the WPD are both inputting data, and it sounds like a war from 911. Where is it going to be housed? To be determined, I think. Um, obviously, the WPD, if they go forward on their system, um, I can't speak for them how they would do it, but that, that is, I think, an issue to be determined. Um, you know, obviously, the I say obviously, it seems to me obvious that the DA, uh, sheriff, and all the other county agencies would probably be maintained by our local or our you know, county IT uh, with help from our own independent. I mean, I've got, a, I've got some folks that work for me uh, in my office, and I, uh, I don't know if the sheriff's got an IT person in particular, but I'm sure he does. Um, but, you know, I think that's to be determined, but that would make, make the most sense, it seems to me. Well, since part of this is county and part of it uh, is city, what's the, what's the relationship in terms of cost sharing or cost? obligation or whatever it is. I, I, let's put it this way. I don't think we've gotten that far yet. I mean, what we're talking about right now is seeing if we can find something that works for everybody. I mean, what a sheriff needs for the road patrol, it may not be markedly different than what the, the WPD needs for their uh, patrol officers, but, but the sheriff also runs the jail, which is a different animal altogether. And I'll let the sheriff speak to that. CAD is different. You know, so to find a, a one, one system that is just plug in, ready to roll uh, for for every en entity in the, that's involved here uh, may be difficult. So what's, the, what's the timetable that you're hoping for? Well, personally, I'm, I'm holding my breath a little bit from the Supreme Court, only to say um, we were waiting for about a year to find out what they were going to do, and then it gets rolled out in September. We have been given an estimate uh, of implementation of June of 19. That is not written in stone. I'm not sure it's written in ink, um, but that's what we've been told uh, at least. So over the next year, 
year and a half, you know, that'd be great. Now on the flip side, if the WPD needs to move forward, um, you know, they're moving forward on their own. They have their thing, but to their credit, they've agreed to at least have this conversation with us and see if we can, if they can slow down a bit and we can speed up, we might find ourselves sometime in 18 at least. I mean, the other thing is June of 19 is implementation. That's not, okay, we'll start to build the thing now. It needs to be ready to roll. So over the next 18 months, I think we're going to have to get this, you know, these kinks worked out and make decisions that are going to affect all these agencies. Sounds like the efficiency, uh, I mean, it sounds like to them it's probably not hugely different in terms of the, this system versus that system. I mean, it's a newer system, but it doesn't save them necessarily, input time necessarily. Uh, when you say them, you're talking about? WPD. Okay. But from our side, the 911 ties into it, and then you have access to both, so it, saves, it sounds like it saves your office a lot of effort and saves duplicate, duplicate, duplication of effort and streamlines the process on the county side. So I'm just curious, so WPD is, uh, they are very supportive of this and they're willing to, I guess, be a partner on this. Let's put it this way. At the end of the day, they have to have a system that works for them and if they feel like their system's compromised and they need the support, I mean, they're going to have to move forward. My, but they, they're in the room, they've agreed, the sheriff and I and the, and the chief have sat down and talked and everybody understands that having an integrated system, and that can mean different things, but an integrated system is beneficial so that when the officer on the street inputs the information, it can be pulled by the sheriff and by me, ultimately by the court system. Um, I mean, it just helps in terms of human resources. Just, you can imagine the efficiencies. Um, but, but the bottom line is I'm not, you know, each of us run our own departments. We're going to have to do what's, what's right for our departments. But we wanted you to know we're having this conversation. We're trying to get on the same page um, because there's going to be a, a cost. There's going to be a bill associated with all of this. It's inevitable that, that we're going to have to go to uh, upgraded systems and, and uh, new systems. I mean, the Supreme Court goes to a new system. I've got, to up, I've got to at least be able to interact with it, whether I go to their system or another. Uh, but again, lots to be worked out, but you needed to be aware uh, of the fact that a, a, I'm trying to be, you know, a whole lot of effort is going into this right now behind the scenes among the various agencies. Okay, well, we appreciate well, we have another comment. Well, I guess my question is, do we put out an RFI that spells out all of these different needs? Uh, and if we do, when do we put that RFI out? And, and uh, uh, what kind of information do you need from uh, all of the players to get that done? I'm not even sure we're ready for RFI yet. <coughs> um, and I want to let the sheriff finish. But the, we are at the stage right now where we are beginning to look at what other, what uh, Chairman just brought up, looking at what other city and counties have been doing around the country and seeing if there's a potential solution out there. So we're in that very beginning stage. Uh, all, that, all that's been done currently is we have money allocated for a CAD system in 2018, 19, and 20. The records management issues that have come up with the DA, with the sheriff, PD's been looking for theirs for <coughs> months. Uh, that's all just coming to a surface right now to where we're seeing an opportunity maybe to do something together here that would be efficient and maybe cheaper. Um, so we will get to that point, I think, uh, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet. And I, I keep excluding uh, Forensic Science Center, too. I don't know if Dr. Rourke's going to talk or not. But uh, So we have a chance here to, to do something all together, which would give us a, a superior system in Cedric County. So, so this is information. That's so correct. Let us know where you're headed. Yeah. And we're all in favor of efficiency and working together. Yeah. So and I, we, we give you. A I might just mention the end game too. The the money for CAD is setting there. You'll you'll see on our financial forecast that we'll prepare at the end of this year. These records management needs will be in that document. So we're telling you about it today. You're going to begin to see it on <coughs> budget documents, and then the question is going to be for for Lindsay is if we do push the gas on our end of the project. How's that money going to come about? Where can we get it from? And then we have to see if WD, uh, WPD can tap the brakes on their project for just a little bit. And we, so we're all trying to work that out behind the scenes. Okay. Very good. Sure. Just, uh, you know, to kind of reiterate, when um, Mr. Howard asked about uh, the, the, the city county sharing, I don't see this as a city county sharing. Um, the city would pay for whatever they're in if we go with the same one we would pay for our, our entity. It, it's just a matter of us being on the same system. Some of the research that I've done, there is city and counties uh, out there that have uh, systems. In fact, the chief came from Duluth, Minnesota, which they're all on the same system. 
Uh, again, we looked at this in, in about 2004, 2003, uh, because of personalities, whatever, it didn't come to fruition. Uh, and so we all went our separate ways. We are not supported. Uh, at the time that our system was bought uh, for a million dollars, it was the cheapo version. There is a lot of issues with iLeads, which we currently have, uh, including the tracking system, which is non existent because that costs more. That's very problematic in keeping any records, especially law enforcement records. And so, uh, what I'm looking for mainly is especially with CAD, because what happens right now, we have duplication of services. So when we fill out a report, CAD does not op auto-populate it, which with a system that is integrated together, it's already auto-populated. We don't have to fill out anything but narrative. When we submit that report currently, it has to go put into a clear form to be sent to the state for tracking. We have to data enter the clear form now. So a deputy enters it, a clerk takes it, enters it again to make it adaptable to the clear form. Uh, so we have duplication of services right there. And as you know from the last budget process, that's why I need more people or another, some other avenue. And so what's important for me is, is that we're on board with CAD immediately on the same system uh, because it, the efficiencies on it are just going to be so much better. The other thing that, that comes out of it is, is, is when we're talking about Wes and his group, any of those interfaces, if we go separate, which they're building up, they're having to build constantly, uh, cost money, not only from Wes's group, but cost money to work on those interfaces with the companies themselves. Uh, and so that's when we've, we've asked the Wichita Police Department uh, here quite a while back. We were looking at some systems together, uh, just seeing what was out there. They're on a timeline that's different than us uh, because um, they're looking at monies to be allocated now. And so what we're looking for uh, is the possibility to actually start going out and researching some of these systems to see what would best fit all of the entities in the room because right now for us to get into full court, it's a whole different training session, it's a whole different um, log on session, those type of things. Right now we've had issues between uh, city records and county records uh, because Full court is not the sheriff system. That is the state court system. And so we have tons of cops calling over to our people. Remember, we only have two at night on third shift, one in county records. We resolve that by going to uh, and training uh, city records over there on the state court system. How they can log into it, the interface had to be made, those type of things. Because we don't have the time to give them state court records because they're not ours and so this would resolve all of those issues we would be able to freely get into the Wichita Police Department system without an interface going on because it's all the same record systems vice versa it's very regional policing at this point in time uh, you know briefly uh, we had an incident happen yesterday that we found in the county it involves all city of Wichita people that we have to get into city records and do the backgrounds on so right now, that's set up through an interface. Through an integrated record system, we no longer have that. The other problem is, is that any time anybody is booked, either from the city or county, they fill out their paperwork, they hand it to the jail deputy, he, has to re he or she has to refill out the paperwork and start that system all over again. These systems now, once it auto-populates in the field, because we're trying to go paperless, but our systems are preventing us from doing that, once that's auto-populated, the deputy or the officer fills in the narrative part, which is just the probable cause statement, ships it to the county, and by the time they get there, we have the booking form. Thank you very much. Just give us the property, and off they go. So it cuts down a ton of time. But we have to find a system that offers CAD, RMS, and JMS for me, which is the jail management system, and there is systems out there. Uh, the other piece of this that needs to be integrated is Dr. Roring's piece because he does all the forensic testing for us. That's all we could be done electronically now as far as the paperwork being submitted and all of the reports submitted back electronically. And I'll let Dr. Rorig talk about that. And then if there's any questions afterward, um, please let us know. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Sheriff, for inviting the, uh, the center to the conversation. Uh, a lot of what you've already heard uh, will impact us as well. When there's an arrest, when there's a crime, 
there's evidence submitted. Uh, a deputy or detective may bring the evidence over and we'll start entering in their case numbers, suspects' names, and all the demographics that go with this. I have one evidence technician, and we process tens of thousands of pieces of evidence every year. So any incremental savings I can have as far as <coughs> taking information that one of his folks or PD detective or somebody already enters, and that can be imported into our system, then we don't have to retype it. That saves me keystrokes, man hours, but also reduces errors. Uh, when we go to court, uh, when uh, Mr. Bennett's litigating these things, one of the things they look at is the accuracy of the information. You know, do our numbers match their numbers and things like this. So having an integrated system would really help us capture some efficiencies, improve quality, and I think you've heard a, a lot of the other things, but just transport, uh, you know, reports back. You know, we issue paper reports. If they could have access to that information, uh, we wouldn't have to make copies and send it to three different areas. Uh, we didn't mention discovery, but I, I, I see there may be a potential uh, for discovery. Uh, when discovery is requested, one of the things they want is everything that we have. Right now, we scan it, copy it, put it on a thumb driver disk, send it over to the DA, and they reprocess things uh, as well to meet their needs and meet the needs of the discovery request. So this integration, this automation, I think could uh, you know, give us a lot of incremental savings, and then I can use my scientific staff to do science instead of doing some of this clerical work that we're forced to do. So I think with that, uh, Sheriff and uh, Mr. Bennett uh, covered everything else, so I'll, I'll just stop there unless you have questions. Is there any other questions of the forums? I don't see any. I think we um, understand that you're going forward trying to make something to make us better and more okay. That ultimately means dollar savings. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we had, sir. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, before we make a mad rush to the refreshments over here, <coughs> is there anything else you want to say? Corey, Richard, Davis, Michael. Okay. Any of uh, the rest of the elected folks or staff in the room have a comment they want to make? Election office, Tuesday. Do you want to? We're having elections Tuesday, right? Correct. Just confirming. Okay. 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 All right. Anything else? Okay, we'll be adjourned. Thank Thanks, you all sir. for being here. And get a <coughs> cupcake or a cookie or...